thank you so much for being here with us today and for sharing your story. My pleasure. Could you please start by telling us the name that you were born with? My name was Peter Wolfgang Goldschmidt. Goldschmidt. And I was born in the city of Danzig, which was an independent country for about 20 years until the Second World War arrived. And so I remember you telling me when you were born, your first name was Wolfgang because that was the Wolfgang German name. Wolfgang was a German name, absolutely. And was that the name that you were called when you were little? That's what I was called when I was little. <laughs> And so you were born in the free city of Danzig. Right. Um, what day were you born on? March 6th, 1934. Right. And can you tell us a little bit about Danzig? Danzig was a seaport. It was the only way for Central Europe to ship goods to the Baltic and out into the ocean because the rest of the countries are all landlocked. There is no way to get out. So Danzig was always very important and all the traffic went through it. All the only way you could do it. And what language did you speak? We spoke German. But you were not German. No, I was not German. I was by birth a Danziger. And when you were born, were you born in a hospital? I was born in a hospital, yeah. Yes, I was born in a hospital. Um, and I know your sister, you, have a, you had a younger sister, and yes. what was her name? And she was not born in a hospital. She was born a at a home because at that point, Jews were no, lo no longer allowed to go to doctors. That was totally forbidden. And so that was in 1938 when she was That's born right. at home. That's right. Perfect. And, you know, Peter, could you tell us about your parents and your grandparents, what well, they were like before the I war? If I go back to my grandparents, my grandfather on my mother's side was Julius, and he was in the army in the First World War for Germany. Um, but he didn't particularly like being in the army, so I have pictures of him when he was younger in always in hospital gear because he really didn't want to fight that war <laughs> and that was my uncle that was my grandfather. grandfather my grand my uncle who was born of that family was a musician and had the same love of piano that i have in my music that i do so when he came visited people in the united states who were friends and went back his piano was most important, and he went to relatives. He didn't come home after a day. He didn't come home after two days. Three days went by, and my grandfather's getting very nervous. Where in the world is my son? So he gets on a train, dresses very dramatically, and goes to look for him. He gets to that town and finds out that every Jew was killed, completely gone. So my grandfather comes back, and they put him in jail. Now my grandfather has told me that he was ready to commit suicide because he said, hey, what is there? But he had been so, had so many people, friends, who were not Nazis, that they said, Julius, they got Julius out of jail, said, get home, get your wife, you, and we had a friend, and the two of you get out of town today. They left everything. They left everything, just what they had in their pocket, and moved to North Africa to a city called Tangier. Well, when they got to Tangier, it was amazing. The people were so poor or so backward that the few dollars they had in their pocket made them fairly comfortable living for two years until my parents managed to get them to the United States. And when they yeah. got here, now they took well, the and second. And we'll stop, we'll, we'll go back to that soon. I want to know more about your family first. Is that okay? Okay, my family. So and my so grandfather came back here. And so you said your grandfather, um, what did he do after the war? 
after the war, I joined the army. Oh, what did your grandfather do in Danzig when he came back from the war? He was he a, was butcher, a butcher. As, had, as he had been when he, when he grew up, before he got his money, he was a butcher. And you said that he had a lot of friends and did very well. Yes, They're, and they were all Danzigers, and we would have poker nights and other things. And um, we only spoke German at home. I only spoke German at home. I did not know English, and I was very fortunate. And we're going to get to that. First, we're going to go back to Danzig. Yeah. Because there's more that I want to know. Okay. Um, what was your grandmother's name? Teresa Lisse, L-I-S-S-E-R. And my grandfather was Julius, Julius Lisse, same thing. And your grandparents, um, so they were from Danzig. Yeah. And what about your mother? Can you tell us a little bit my, about now her? My mother was, I wouldn't call it royalty. I would say my grandfather had become so wealthy that everybody in town knew him, the government knew him, and he had so much money, he lent money to people that needed it. Didn't make, didn't make any difference to them. They lived, you can't imagine how well they lived until the war came. And then everything. And then, of course, everything changed. And before we get to the war, you told me a story about your father and your mother. And so we haven't brought up your father yet and what he did and where he came from. My father was poor. My father was more than poor. He, during the early years, basically had nothing. What he used to do is he used to go in the fields when people were taking the crop in and anything that fell down was what he ate. His sister, who lived with him, did the same thing. But she couldn't because she had nothing to put on her feet even. So she, they both basically starved. Fortunately, later on, that sister came to the United States and married an American. Mm. Once she married an American, that American managed to get, to guarantee that we were not a burden to the United States and they brought us back to the United States. Yeah. And my grandparents moved into a house that we had rent, an apartment, let's say, that we had rented. Now, since my grandparents were living there, I couldn't sleep in that bed, so I slept on the trunks that we had with some rugs, and I spent many a year living on that particular trunk. Where did your sister sleep? My sister slept in a carriage. I, I'm assuming, I don't remember tightly where she slept, but that, that is really the way it was. And, and I want to go back a little bit. Yes. Because your father was not born in Danzig, was he? No, he was not born in Danzig. He was born in Astro Romania. <laughs> and Romania at that time was a part of the <laughs> Germanic group that was there at that time. No, he was not born there, no. And so how did he meet your mother? He met my mother when she came to town and he was working as an assistant pharmacist living in the attic of the house because there was no place else to live for him. And she being so very wealthy, they met and I evidently fell in love. And when my grandfather was wealthy said, how can you go with that man? I mean, that's... That's impossible. She said, I'm going to marry him. Oh. And she did marry him. And that was my grandfather and my grandmother. They must have been thrilled. Oh, that? yes, they were <laughs> thrilled, all right. That's for sure. And I remember you said something about Berlin, that your mother was sent away for a little while. Oh, my mother left because my mother left when my grandfather said, you can't marry that man. He has nothing. And she left and went back to Berlin. And of course, that didn't last long because my grandfather said, well, you might as well marry him. And since my father had been a pharmacist, and at that point, at that point, pharmacies were all right, but the Nazis 
did not let Jews have pharmacies, or at least have anybody but Jews go mm. to the store. And when they got out, they used to get beat up. So my father had many friends who were not Nazis, and they used to wait in front of the store to take him home so they wouldn't beat him up. And then my aunt, my father's sister, moved to the United States and married an American. Mm. And only because they got married did we get here, because at that time the United States was undergoing a, a tremendous depression. We, we had no money here. So she had married an American, and I'm trying to remember exactly how that went. She married an American. My grandparents babysat for me and my sister while my mother went to work minding other people's children. And my grandfather, who had been a butcher early in his life, went back to being a butcher again. But he was a butcher in a camp, in a children's camp. Now, of course, he spoke no English. So I had to go with him when he made the contract at because I understood English. And when we got to camp, I had to speak for him when he was there. And he spent every winter. And then we came back here. He went to work for a large American meat company, which from what I hear is still in business. And the camp is still in business That's after amazing. all these years. And you know, it sounds like you had a really special relationship. Excuse me? It sounds like you had a very special relationship with your oh, family. Oh, I, I was so close. Well, we grew up together. I grew up living with my grandparents. We lived in the same apartment. And I had the same room. And we, we, we simply lived together. And we spoke only German at home. And, and I mean only German. And what I want to know is, you know, you were a little boy in yes. Danzig. But I know you have some memories from that time. Oh, yes. Do you, what do you remember? Um, what I remember from... From, from Danzig. That, from Danzig? Yeah. I re actually, I do remember the, f the outside of my father's store. I remember the local liquor store. And I remember the name was Lion's Blood. Lions. In German, of course. I do remember that clearly. Uh, I don't know if I remember very much more of that. And... Did you know when you were little that you were Jewish? Oh, absolutely. In fact, when I was a little boy and my grandmother and I, she took me on the trolley car to go somewhere. And as a little boy, you see what you hear. And I saw a Nazi on board in uniform. And I looked up at my grandmother and I said, that's one of those, in German, of course, What's one of those lousy Nazis? Mm. And my grandmother was so frightened that he would do something that she grabbed me and took me off the trolley car. And he didn't do anything, but we were out. Wow. And at that point, we went back and they threw my grandfather in jail. And he was in jail. He was going to commit suicide until we found out that we had an aunt who had moved to the United States mm -hmm. and married an American. And she guaranteed that we would not be a burden to the American people. That's how we got to this country. And I lived with all of them all this time. And I, in fact, we were so poor, we rented one of our bedrooms out. We rented the bedroom out to another woman who for some reason happened to have the last name, our last name, but she was not related. But she spoke English fluently. And she took me aside as I was a child and started teaching me English. And that's how I learned to speak English. And that's how you ended up helping your family of course. and your grandfather. And now my, gran my, my father, I would almost call him a linguist. He hears a language, he knows it. I have no idea where that came from, how it came from, but he picks up a language. I think he spoke four languages wow. <laughs> fluently. And all the time we lived together, even later life, 
He was also having a dictionary open in front of him all the time, all the time. And that's, that's how that part of life started. And one thing that I, I would love for you to tell us about is the journey to America, what that was like. You were on a ship. We were on a ship to Pilsudski. We were on a ship to Pilsudski since everyone on board the ship was seasick. Everybody was throwing up. Nobody could move. My sister's carriage was tied to my mother's bed. I and a gentleman who I met took me to the dining room. He didn't get seasick, and I don't get seasick. And I ate every night with him, every meal <laughs> for the two of us while everybody else was sick until we got to the United States. And since we had an aunt who had married an American, she said, come to St. Louis, you can live with us for a while, which we did for a limited amount of time. But her money, of course, ran out too. And so we came back to the New York and I started, and my grandfather went back to being a butcher and I started going to school. Now school was very difficult. They spoke only English. There was no such thing as a second language in schools. It didn't exist. I failed the first year. I failed the second year. I probably failed the third year until we rented the room to that lady who taught me English. Thank goodness for that lady. Yeah, absolutely. And I continued to know her until she passed away and her sister later on passed away. And but that's how I learned English. And I have a question because yes. you mentioned on the ship it was you, your mother Gerda, and your sister Carla. Yeah. Where was your father? My father could not come on the same ship. Uh, where was my father? He was not on the ship with mm -hmm. us. No. He, w he was still in Romania because Romania at that point was joining the Nazis or something. So he could he couldn't come over with us, but he had to go directly to England, and then from England, he got back here. But we were, we were separated, uh, that's for sure. Because he, has a, he had a different nationality, and so yes. he was on a different quota yeah. than you, your mother, and sister. Yes. Uh, but he came shortly after you did? Excuse me? He came soon after you did, he arrived? It took a little while. And you've told us a little bit about going to stay with Sophie in St. Louis well, and then coming back. Well, we went to St. Louis, but at that time there was a recession in this country. People had no jobs. So we could not stay there more than a very short time till we were sent back to New York. Well, the only thing my grandfather knew how to do was be a butcher. So he got a job as a butcher, and that company happens to still be in business, I've, I've recently seen. <laughs> and my father, what could he do? He used to work at a department store, uh, which has also gone Klein's, which was on 14th Street in New York, and his job was to hang the hangers up that women who had tried on dresses, he put the hangers away. And my mother, babysat for other babies while my grandparents babysat for my sister and myself. A very, very different life yes. than they had led in Danzig. Yes. <laughs> and you know, the area that you moved to in New York, me? the area that you moved to the neighborhood yes. was called Washington Heights. Washington Heights at that time, right. And Absolutely. who lived there? A, a lot of German, German people. We all spoke German in Washington Heights. And that was not a problem. It was only a problem in school mm -hmm. when they spoke English. Oh, yes, we spoke German all the time. And I was fortunate that this lady lived with us and taught me English. And as the years went by, all of my friends and family friends, they used to get together for whatever reason. We all only spoke German at home. Yes. And did your parents learn English? My, my father learns languages, I cannot explain it, but he has an ear for languages, he learned it immediately. Took my mother a while longer to learn English, yes. It's difficult as an adult to learn a language. It definitely is, but he had some natural something, I can't explain it, 
My mother it took a long time. She was babysitting, but she was babysitting for people who also spoke German, of course. And then later on, she got a job. After that, she got a job in a factory working on a sewing machine, still speaking German, of course. And eventually, they all, we all lived in the same apartment. And it got to the point where I was already in my, I was probably in my teens when I had my bar mitzvah, which of course was in a German synagogue, which was of course in German in the synagogue. And that was fine, that didn't bother me. But of course, when I got home, I had to give another speech, this one in German, for the relatives that I had who had all come in who could not speak English. <laughs> and from that point on, when I turned 18, I said, I owe this country something. And I joined the military. Yes. And one thing before I forget, because it was something that I thought was really fun. When you helped your grandfather, Julius, Yes. At the camp, you would work part-time. I would work part-time being the baker. Yes. How did you learn to be a baker? I have no idea. I can't tell you that either. I don't know it out either. Even today, if I wanted to, I could bake. I could. Something that happened, I have no idea why. And did you get to spend any time um, relaxing or enjoying things at the camp? Excuse me? Did you get to spend time at the camp doing other things? Yes, I horseback ride. I, am a, I have been a nut for horseback riding all my life. And I used to take the horses that they had and I would spend the rest of the day out riding. And I'm, until I got to the point where I was too old to ride, I was still riding here in this country. So <laughs> that was unexplainable why. <laughs> Those are the good memories. Oh, the excellent memories. Excellent. And I would love to hear you said that you felt like you owed something. I owed the United States for having saved us and for winning the war and having Jews no longer be killed. I felt I owed it, that I was going to pay back what they had given me and my family. That's at 18 when I joined the Army. And so you joined and you served for two years in the Korean I War. I two years in the Korean War, right. And can you tell us what it was like to be a young German-speaking Jew? Well, the interesting point was there were six of us on board who all spoke German. And a lot of these people had barely gone to school. So we, the six of us who spoke German, would tell them what to do, show them what to do, as if we, as if we had any rank on us, but we were sort of the bosses trying to help them out. And I spent my two years doing that. And I believe you did something else while you were in the military. The Jewish chaplain would call on you. Excuse me? The Jewish chaplain? Oh, the, the chaplain would call on me and Whenever I, since we worked 24 hours, he would call on me on the days that I did not work, and I would come in and I would do the services with him and be the cantor at all of the Jewish services for the military. Wow. And, you know, so you said, you know, music was a very big part. Extremely big. Of your life, and you said your Uncle Martin. Yes. That music was a very big part it of his life. It was his whole life. life. And... Did you ever think about becoming a professional yes, musician? Yes, very much so. Of course, I did not know what was going on here. So we, I went to try out for the amateur hour. Uh, the Ted, Ted Max. Max. Ted Max amateur hour. I went to try out for Ted Max Wonder Show. And what would I sing? I would sing something that was in my head. And I sang a song called, Tell Me Where Those Tell me, where can I go? There's no place I can see, no, where to go, where to go. Every door is closed to me. Feeling, hey, great piece of music. And what do you think? They turned me down. They, they only turned me down. They told me to leave. And I wondered why. And then I found out that they were anti-Semitic. 
the man that owned the show was anti-Semitic and I could not sing there. <laughs> and that's when I got back. And when I was in synagogue, I used to be, I was the youngest man to sing in the chorus of the synagogue all the time. I did that. I did that for a lifetime until my grandparents finally had to move from our apartment because we were all growing up and there wasn't any room left. And, and I continue, and as I say, I work with my grandfather at camp with him. We worked together and I loved it. And the camp is still around too. That's amazing. It's ama they're still in business. And the most interesting thing is one of the men who is part of ownership is a musician. And he played with New York Symphony. So how do you put those together? It was very strange. Yeah. Life is very strange. Oh, very strange. Very strange. And you mentioned experiencing anti-Semitism when you were at the Ted Mack show, when yes. you were auditioning. Um, did you experience anti-Semitism in other parts of your life? Yes, yes, yes. In neighborhoods, people would be true. In fact, I know going down the street in my old neighborhood, they beat me up. And that taught me another lesson. It taught me you can't get beat up the second time. And that's when I started weightlifting and going to gyms. And then when the next time the same young men came around, I stood and said, try me. They never tried again. <laughs> that was the end of that. And I continued to work out and all my life until I got into businesses and things where I had limited time to do it. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. And something nice. Can you tell us about meeting your wife? Meeting my wife, yes. I, we went to a singles club in New York. And it's a place where single people meet single people. And I'm smoking a small cigar. And my wife walks by, smells it, and makes a smart remark to, remark to me about my cigar. And I say, hmm, when she comes back from the, gentle, from the ladies room, I'm going to tell her off, which I did. Which I'm trying to remember what happened, which I did. And, of course, she apologized some way, and we got together. And I'd been only married a short time when I had to go away on business, on the road. And I said to her, well, when I get back, I'll call you up. But she must have thought, huh, he'll never call me back. So I go on the road in business, and I'm traveling from one town to the other, where the German helped me, where I was, I was speaking English then, so it was all very easy. And I'd be away for 10, 12 days, and then I come back and called her up. And of course, the next thing was, we got married. <laughs> and, and I continued in that business for 40 years. And what and is I'd, your wife's name? My wife's name, <laughs> Faith Goldsmith. It was, I don't remember what it was. I was too far away, it's Faith Goldsmith. And do you have children? I have three children, yes. Yes. I have, whoa. That's okay. I'm having a hard time remembering my children. Oh, Jessica. Joy. Je Joy. <laughs> oh. That's okay. Jessica drove me here today. Yeah. And, and Joy, and there's a third one. I I'm losing it. That's okay. That's okay. But you have three children. Yes. And do you have any grandchildren? Yes. We have two grandchildren. The two grandchildren, yes. Oh. And that's okay. I'm, I have grandchildren. I know my grandchildren. I see them all the time. But I'm starting to black out on certain things. That's okay. Um, yeah. They still love you. That's all that matters. Excuse me? You still love each other. Absolutely. 
Uh, she drove me here today, of course, <laughs> yes. And when your children were growing up, yes. did you speak to them about your life during the war? Absolutely. We made them totally aware of what it was like. And since the neighborhood that we lived in, everybody spoke German, they all learned what had happened from the neighborhood, from the people, from the synagogue that I used to go to. They were totally aware of it. Nothing was hidden. Yes, nothing was hidden. That's true. And you and your father used to visit and study the Holocaust a lot. Apt. Well, very interestingly, he and I went to the museum in New York. We used to like to go to museums. And as we go to the museum, there is a display. And I'm looking at the display and I said, something looks familiar. My father and I walk over. It is the synagogue that I was circumcised in that they got married in. They had all of the implements because they figured that someday they would send it back to the United States, which of course never happened. But I saw everything and where I was circumcised, where they got married, totally, because it became a totally German-Jewish neighborhood. Yes. And so that was the Danzig Synagogue had sent things over yes, to the United States. Yes, all sent it over, absolutely. And was there also a photo of the butcher shop there? I have it here with us. Wonderful. Oh, we great. have that. Oh, we have the picture of all of those things. That was the Lisser butcher shop. <laughs> right. And, you know, one thing that I want to know is, did you ever want to go back to Danzig? Not only did I not want to go back to Danzig, I've traveled around a, quite a bit of the world. I would not go to Germany. For, for whatever reason, I said, they didn't want me, I don't want them. Very interestingly, my wife and I went on a, to a, on a vacation. And why Austria, which was also German, drew me, I can also not explain. Uh, basically because of classical music. And we had a couple with us who spoke no English, uh, no German. And I would constantly translate, constantly be talking German to them, which was fine by me. We happened to go, oh, we got a driver, a German. He spoke, and I was speaking to him in German all the time. He kept saying, he could hear something. He said, where are you from? I said, the United States. A little while later, he asked me the same question again, the United States. I said, okay. He asked me a third time, and I said, I'm from Danzig. He looks up and he says, oh, you look for political reasons, <laughs> which of course, and that's that story. And did anyone from your family ever go back to visit? No. Did Carla go back? Carla went back later on in life. After she heard the stories that we told her, she went there. She went, the only people going back was a Christian group for, for, I don't know what for, but they were all there. She left them and looked around and got a man who's, who she could speak to, who took her to our old houses and the store and everything that was standing that was still left standing. So she saw dancing very well. Of course, she never went back again there. Yes. And did she show you the pictures when she came back? Of oh, what she um, saw? undoubtedly. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And I believe that we have the pictures somewhere. Oh, yes. And we'll look at photos in a few minutes. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to know, there were so many Danzigers that settled in yes. Washington Heights. Um, do you still have relationships with anybody today? There are almost none left. There are almost no Danzigers left alive because of age. There just nobody left except one dancing friend that I went to school with, I went to temple with, and he I see, we see each other quite often. Yes, that we do. And I remember you saying that you had a friend whose wife was a hidden child. 
that a friend of yours, their wife is a hidden child. Oh yes, oh yes, yes. I lived in an apartment house, I had my room, and they lived in the apartment down from me. They were hidden children. Her, she, during the war, was taken in by a Christian family and lived with them. She could not go out of the house during the daytime if they would see her. She could only walk out at night. She had a brother who went through the same thing, but he unfortunately passed away very young. And that friend of mine is still my friend. We still speak to each other quite often. Now she has new grandchildren, new husband. But yes, we were very tight and we're still tight. We have just talked to her the other night. And I remember you telling me about Frankie, somebody named Frankie, who was the child of your parents' friend. Who, what's her name? Frankie. Frankie. Um, oh, Frankie. Oh, Fra oh, Frankie. Yes. Frankie, that was family that we had in Danzig that we knew very well. And he was working in the United States. And he got a job downtown New York. And they told everybody in the building things are going on, there's going to be danger. Leave, which he left. Then he got a call and they said, nothing's going to happen here. Please go back, which he went back to his office. The next thing we knew, there was the bombing, and he died instantly. And his sister, who is still my friend, went out and got all of the Jewish people that she could find that she knew and helped them out to come back to Upper Manhattan, where the, Jewish, where the German Jewish neighborhood was. And she lived there. She is still alive. She is still single, and she, and she is very wealthy. And she kept the apartment in the old neighborhood for when she passes away and she can no longer do anything, she will, she will live there. She's not going anywhere. She is not going anywhere. And we talk to her frequently. Oh, yes. So it was a very close community. Very close, very close, very close. And I'd like to know why you're choosing to share your story with us now. Because I think the world should know this. These are things that are hidden, that we kind of don't want to know about it. We don't want to know anything that's unpleasant. And if it's unpleasant, you, don't, you really try to avoid knowing it. Well, this is history. This is what really happened. This is how the world was then and how it is now, and therefore, if you don't want to learn it, you will make the same mistakes that they made. And this is to prevent you from doing those stupid things. Thank you. You're welcome. And what I'd like to do is maybe we can take a moment, yes. we can take a pause, and we're going to bring the photos over. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so if you can start speaking about the photos. Okay, so first of all, I'm Faith Goldsmith, and Peter's wife of I think 57 years. So, they, right. so what Peter is holding is a picture of the synagogue in Danzig, um, which was destroyed by the Nazis. Do you remember the synagogue? As a small child, I really don't. I really don't. And uh, but in rel in relationship to this. I must say there is something interesting that happened. My father and I happened to be going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And we're walking in the museum, like any American does, and we see a display. And I said, what is that display? It's the things that had been taken from the Jewish synagogue, which we had sent to the United States to save. It had been here in this country being shown in a museum. And I think that was more than unusual. We were just stunned, totally stunned. Now, yeah. this is, he mentioned his okay. grandfather's butcher store. 
This was my grandfather who had been so wealthy and so well known had to go and be a butcher. But this again. was in Danzig. This is the this butcher is shop in Danzig. This is in Danzig, of course. And this is his father's wait, pharmacy. Wait, 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 one thing at a time. And what does it say? What does it say? Julius Lisser, his name. And Lisser was the family name. And it says kosher. Oh, and that, where does, oh, it says kosher on the window. Of course, it was, of course it was going to be kosher. I, I wouldn't even question it. Okay. <laughs> And this is the picture of my father's pharmacy in Danzig. And who's in the picture? I think it was my grandfather and I do not, oh, it was my father. My father wearing the gray suit and my grandfather in the white shirt. You got other pictures too. Yeah, there's yeah. more pictures from Danzig. Now, this, this is, these are pictures of your grandfather in the German army. Oh yes, oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just take this. No, this is a picture. Just, I'll just pull this picture to last. Now, here is a picture of my grandfather, who was in the German army in the First World War. And which one? Do you know which one is your grandfather? I absolutely know who it was. Second man in the lower ranks. Right here. That was my grandfather. This was my grandfather in a formal picture in the German army. Here's my grandfather again, smoking his usual cigar. Turn over here. Is that in Danzig or in the United States? That looks like Danzig to me. This was my grandmother in Danzig. Teresa. Excuse me? Teresa. Teresa. Okay. Now this Danzig. is a picture of the uncle that no, I that's was- your father. Oh, this is my father here, that's right. Here's a picture of my father in those early days in Danzig. Look very fancy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is with the Nazi thing oh, cut yeah. out. That's your grandmother and grandfather. The, oh, this, I, I know what and that they is. they had the Nazi thing uh, they cut out. And they cut it out. But this is when the Nazis were already taking over Danzig. And my grandparents were. And at some point, they cut out the Nazi flag, so I don't have it here to show. What else have you got there that I can show? Okay, we have, uh, let's, this is Martin. This is my Uncle Martin, who was a pianist. That's where I think I got my talent for music from him. He came to the United States and visited friends. And then this, they were already here, and the Nazis were in power, but he was thinking music, music, music. Went back to Danzig and went to a relative for the High Holy Days. Didn't come home. My grandfather says, where's my son? Waited a day, waited two days, waited three days. Then I gotta go and find him. He went back to that city where he had been 
and every single Jew in town had been killed. And did your, it was very dangerous for your grandfather oh, to go. Oh, well, he looked Germanic. He has Germanic features. As, and he, he kind of, he lied his way there, let's call it that way. He took a chance, a big chance. And that's a pic with that picture of that uncle. And here's a picture of him when he was a youngster. Oh, this, I'm trying to find the date on this, if there is one. Oh, it's on the back here. In Danzig, in, th impossible picture. No, that I can't tell the date. It's certainly not 1472. <laughs> Why don't you hold it up so we can see it? Yes. And he, of course, never made it out. Oh, here he is while well, he was a younger man at the beach in Danzig. So he had a major influence on your life. Yes. Oh, the music that he has in him is where I got my music talent. It was something in the blood. <laughs> Hard to remember. Here oh, oh. is your parents' wedding picture. Oh, yes. In Danzig. This, since my grandfather was so wealthy, uh, I can explain this. The house that we had was so large that you actually moved two of the walls and they became one huge room. This was it's just at my parents' wedding. And were there a lot of people at the wedding? A lot. Well... This is part of the room. Now, here are more pictures of that wedding. We did have a picture of, of the room, of and the there room. had to have been at least 50 or 60 people sitting around a table. <laughs> we just could not find yes. that picture. No, that, that picture has been destroyed, I guess. No, now, that looks like an old one back here, no. which you just turned no. over. No. And here's his sister. Oh, there's a picture of her and me Here. before you get to that. Oh, okay. Here's the early picture. Here's a picture of my sister and myself when we were... Oh, I don't... Let me look at the picture. Somewhere in our early years. That's your sister Clara? Yeah. Carla. 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 Oh, it has a date on it. January 8th, 9th... January 8th... Must have been 1914. No. That's impossible. It's got a date for it there. Yeah, that's... That, the date is... I don't know. No sense trying to figure it out. No. Here's a picture of her now, or a number of years ago. Was she a nurse? She became a nurse, yes. And oh. here's a picture of this, Aunt no, Sophie. Take that picture. This is the picture of the Sophie that had married that gentleman in Danzig and it got us out. Without him, I would not be here. This is here. And... That's an old picture. You've got your hands on it. Yeah, it I'm, I'm trying. Th this is you, you mentioned being oh. the cantor in the army. Oh. While I was in service, since I had studied music all my life, I could sing. So the days that I was not working, since we worked 24 hours a day, we had shifts. Any day that I was not working, I would be the military cantor and do all the services that we had. And I did that as long as I was in the service. And which one is you? I hold this. Sure. That was me doing synagogue services. And of course, when we got here, we went to a German temple. I was, what was I used to? There's one that looks ancient. Oh, that's, that's that was the, the wedding, wedding picture. Yeah. And, um... Well, nobody cares what I looked like when I was a baby that day. No. <laughs> but he had mentioned delivering um, laundry no. on the bike. 
that he oh, had yes. received as a bar mitzvah present, and he is, he is on that First bike. First bike I got, my aunt from Canada, who had so much money, she was a lady in waiting for the queen, bought me a bike. Otherwise, I certainly could not have afforded a bike. And I still have seen that family for years and years until we all grew up and went our separate way. That's, that's, I think that's about it. I think that's... And are those passport yes, documents? Yes, uh, they are. Let me just... Uh, they are. Oh, those are, yeah. This is his father's naturalization papers. And we have his mother's here. Oh, is that your... And these... See, his naturalization was different than ours because he came from a different country originally. And these, we think, were the Let me see papers uh, guaranteeing that, that's his... his yeah, these were, pe pick, these were things guaranteeing that we were not going to cost the United States anything. And he's on his mother's, and Carlo was too young. I think that's it. I, th I, I think we've had it, but I'm not sure. Oh, this is, is your grandfather's oh, my naturalization paper. Naturalization paper becoming an American. What year was that in? 19th, no, you can't make mm -hmm. out the last word on it. Wait a minute. January the 15th, impossible. Oh, it tells his birth date. January 15th, 1869, he was born. What's the date I'm, down there? And the date, the date down date? here. Wait, that? wait, I'm looking for it. It's April. No, that was the address. He became a citizen April twelfth, April twelfth, nineteen forty-eight. Thank you. Okay. Have we got them all? I think so. And was there anything else you wanted to share that we weren't able to speak well, about? Well, not that I want to share, but that I would like to point out that. We have a major problem in this country that we become so, we dislike people of another nationality, of another country. We look down on them. We don't want to give them the same equal rights that we have. And I think that is one big, big, big mistake that we do. And when I vote, I always vote to have things for everyone not just for the rich, and that I will always believe. And is there anything, you know, you're an American. You're a proud American. Absolutely. And, you know, I think what you have done today is you have shared so much of yourself, and you have also showed us what America really is. What America it really is. Yes. Is so many people from different places coming together to make it a better place. And you Absolutely. are part of that fabric. Absolutely. Wonderful. Mm. Well, thank you so much. And I enjoyed this unbelievable. Me too. I really, really did. Thank mm. you. <laughs> thank you. And thank, thank you. you. Okay. Oh. Thank you.